Thank you both so much for joining me today. Uh, Chairman, what I wanted to start with you, a lot of the discussions about the role of government in public health emergencies this session have occurred outside of the health and welfare committees. They've happened in places like state affairs. And so looking back over the last year, I wanted to get your response to the states and the public health districts um, responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Did, did any of these public health districts overstep their bounds? Melissa, thank you for having me on today. Um, you know, my opinion may not necessarily be the opinion of a lot of people around, but I think the first thing to answer that question we have to remember is, is let's go back to the context of what uh, this pandemic uh, was when it started out. And I think everybody, even the experts, were relying on what happened in 2003 with Cove SARS-1 and the disease it caused, which was named SARS. And then I think it was about 2011 when we had uh, MERS, which was also a co uh, coronavirus, which was the Middle Eastern uh, respiratory syndrome. And if you remember, SARS had a mortality rate of somewhere between 10 and 15%, and MERS had a mortality rate of 33%. And as soon as the national security apparatus figured out that there was something bad going on in China, um, everybody began making plans thinking that this virus may have the same effect on populations that those two viruses did because after all, they're extremely closely related. So when um, governors started ordering the shutdowns, et cetera, um, I, I can find no fault at all with an initial reaction. Um, if there was any fault, it wasn't strong enough and it wasn't soon enough. As time went on, um, and we opened up uh, and, and people began to understand what this virus was about, et cetera. And we still don't know that much about it. Uh, I don't think anybody overstepped the bounds um, in terms of, of preparing us for there's something bad going on here. And you still have to remember that more than a half a million people in the United States alone have died from this virus. Uh, true, it has, a lot of people have gotten sick and not have had that much residual uh, illness from it. Um, although about 15% of the people, give or take, will wind up with long-term medical uh, problems associated with this virus. Um, and we're not actually, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of what that uh, is. So I, I don't, I for one, in retrospect, don't think uh, that uh, anybody would have done anything differently. Um, I think that the legislature is reacting from a point of view that um, they weren't, they weren't uh, here to manage um, the crisis or help manage the crisis. And my argument has always been the following. Legislative bodies are deliberative bodies. We're supposed to take weeks to make a decision. We're not supposed to make a decision any sooner than that. But in a pandemic or in ex uh, times of emergency like this, you don't have time to do that. You can't have more than one cook in the kitchen. Uh, I think the governor has done a marvelous job uh, I think he did, has done the best that anybody could have done. And I don't think he needed the legislature to be here to tell him how to spend the money. I can't think of, of a single thing that I would have done different in terms of spending the money. I think that the, that, uh, the methodology that they used and the approach that they used was a sound approach. So, so I don't think so. I, I think that uh, the state is in good hands and has done well. You know, Senator Rancho, I, I wanted to get your thoughts as well. 
Uh, you know, I'm so glad that we have a physician who's the chair of health and welfare, um, really brings the uh, medical perspective and knowledge to the to the situation. So thank you for that. I, I couldn't agree more with Chairman Wood. And um, I had the privilege of sitting on the governor's coronavirus financial advisory committee. And I saw firsthand um, how well the governor and that group really tried to respond efficiently and effectively in the crisis. And as Representative Wood said, uh, the legislative body is a deliberative group and it is structured to take the time it needs to really go through decisions before we enact laws. It is not our role or responsibility to act quickly um, in that emergency. That's why we have a governor. He has been elected statewide and we have uh, faith in that uh, office. Uh, I do think he operated to the constitutional and statutory authority of his office. And I, I so many times thought how I would feel being in his position. And I think he did operate out of good intention and really trying to prevent illness and death. And we heard that in his very first address. Um, I think the CFAC group that he put together, we met, I think, 26 times over the summer. I was very busy reviewing proposals and uh, doing research and really trying in a, in a short time to get resources to the places that needed it. And I do think um, he had a mixture of elected officials, uh, agency directors, business people, I mean, boots on the ground who see the everyday impacts of what's going on. So I think overall, um, I have appreciated his position. Um, as Representative Wood said, I, I, I don't know what I would have changed. I, I thought he was pretty strategic <laughs> and he really, he was really balancing a lot under really unfortunate attacks. Um, and I think it would have behooved us and, and now too, to really think about how we can work together. Um, and, I, and the last thing I would say is again, in that deliberative process, we see it now. The governor got you know resources out quickly. The legislature took eight weeks to get a uh, rental assistance package out. And um, we had already run out of money from the first set there in mid-January. So that is proof in the pudding that we do not want the legislature in that role, just because it's just, you know, 105 people trying to make a decision is not an efficient way to do it. Um, so yeah, I couldn't agree more with Representative Wood on his comments. That said, we have a lot more federal money coming into the state after President Biden signed that relief package on Thursday. So, Senator, should those 105 people have a say in the new money that will be coming to the state soon? Well, I think now that we're not in an immediate crisis where we need to act as swiftly and quickly, um, you know, I, I'm not as opposed to having a say, but I think a better model, again, would be to examine, uh, utilizing the data we have, examining where are the gaps and where do we foresee continued uh, issues going forward. Have, you know, the governor's office put forward a plan, you know, I'm sure he's going to consult with a variety of folks, uh, not just his staff, and put that before uh, the legislature. But but it has to be done uh, pretty we can't be waiting all summer, right? There are some gaps now. And uh, so my only trepidation about the legislature weighing in is that some of the, um, uh, how do I say, um, ideological stands that are being taken are not in the best interest, I think, of Idaho. And so something I said on the Senate floor one day was that, you know, theory and practice are operating differently in our state. In theory, this could be a good thing, but I have not seen it play out well practice. And some of the debates I've seen on the House floor in particular, and some of the lines in the sand being drawn based on ideology that are really harming people. So theoretically, 
The legislature might be well to have a little say, but practically I have not seen us acting in the best interests of our citizens, quite frankly. You know, along those lines, uh, Representative Wood, House Republicans, uh, the majority of House Republicans voted against a supplemental appropriation for the catastrophic health care fund. Uh, a number of, of Republicans in your caucus have also expressed big concerns about the increase in Medicaid funding. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. Uh, are you concerned that these appropriations are not going to pass and that uh, the state won't be paying its bills uh, for the catastrophic health care fund, the, the costs that were spent last year? Melissa, there isn't any doubt about the fact that the state of Idaho is going to pay its bills. Let me, let me put everybody uh, at uh, rest about that. We are going to pay our bills. And I think the body politic understands upstairs that we will pay our bills. We do have to get a couple of three things ironed out. Um, one, the catastrophic health care uh, bill went down for the plain and simple reason that you have to remember that the legislature didn't want to pass Medicaid expansion. The citizens passed Medicaid expansion. And there was a lot of hype, uh, et cetera, as there always is whenever there's a drive to pass any kind of legislation, whether the legislature is going to do it or whether the citizens are going to do it. And, and there was this thought that once Medicaid expansion is passed, um, and there are basically no sideboards on it at this point in time, there's no work requirements or anything. Uh, so everybody who is eligible can sign up if they want to. Um, then we thought that um, the uh, health, the cost to the county industry program and the catastrophic healthcare cost program would be significantly lower than it has turned out to be. Um, then, unfortunately, uh, Millman, who is our actuary, uh, contracted actuary for the state of Idaho, who came up with an estimate of how many people would be on Medicaid once it expanded, additional uh, bodies that would be on it, and they estimated that to be 91,000. Well, they got that just about right. But what they really missed was the cost per member per month or the annual cost per member. And they missed it by double, okay? Now that is missing something really a long ways. So that has significantly elevated the cost for the future of this program. And the legislature, rightly so, is markedly concerned about that. So, We've got to get that sorted out. Now, the way we're going to do that is that uh, I, Health and Welfare Committee in the House introduced a piece of legislation on Monday, or on Tuesday, and we heard it yesterday and sent it up to the floor, whereby what we're going to do is we're going to put the um, public health districts, at this point in time, the state of Idaho funds about 50% of the public health districts. And so we're going to no longer fund that. And that fund is, I mean, that is now going to be funded by the counties. And one of the things that we're going to do in that piece of legislation is to um, decrease the eligibility for the county agency program and the catastrophic health care cost program to make sure that anybody who is eligible for Medicaid will no longer be eligible for those two programs. Anybody who is eligible to go to the state exchange to purchase subsidized health care and certain voluntary commitments will no longer be eligible for the county agency program, the catastrophic health care cost program. Um, I just spoke with the director of health and welfare this morning. I have a weekly meeting with him. We can extend out to June the 30th, um, at least initially, we can extend out um, and open that enrollment period from the 31st of March to the end of June. 
um, and allow everybody so that they understand that they've got three months to go to the state exchange and purchase subsidized health care. So there be no excuse. You, you are, if you're eligible for Medicaid, you go sign up for Medicaid. If you're eligible for subsidized health care, you better go sign up for subsidized health care. Uh, because what you're not going to do is go to the state taxpayer and have the state taxpayer through property taxes pay for your health care. And, and so I think that's the important message. Now, once we get that legislation passed, then I think the catastrophic health care budget and other budgets like that and the Medicaid budget, then we'll go forward and we will pay our bills. Representative Wood, you mentioned earlier that there are a number of legislators who did not want Medicaid to pass. I've heard it brought up in floor debates that there is still a push to overturn Medicaid expansion. So if this legislation passes and then lawmakers then move in a subsequent uh, legislative session to overturn Medicaid expansion, where does that leave uh, people who can't afford health care? Well, that's a whole different program. I mean, that's a whole different question if we don't have uh, Medicaid uh, eligibility the way it is today. If expanded Medicaid is overturned, um, then that's a real issue. But what a lot of people in the House think, and I'm not sure I'm one of those, um, but at least a lot of people think that the old program of the county agency program and the catastrophic health care cost program that we have today, there's a better way of doing that. A better way of funding health care for those people rather than just doing it that way. And, and I suspect there probably is. I don't know if we can come up with that quick enough. That's why we're not actually doing away with those programs. Okay, the program will still be there. And we could lift that eligibility in the matter of a few days if we wanted to do that. So the program is there, the program is still functioning because you gotta remember that both of those programs are loans. They're not grants. So when you go to the county agency program at the CAP fund and you want help, you sign a loan paper and a lien is put on your real property until that is paid back. And we're, we're getting back in that now about $3 million annually uh, from those loans that we have put out. So we have to keep all of that machinery in place. And all we would have to do is to lift the eligibility of the machinery. That's all. Senator Wintrow, I, I wanted to ask you about the costs for Medicaid expansion. You know, as Representative Wood said, they're coming in a lot higher than the Milliman report had initially estimated, not because there were more people who had enrolled, but because the costs of their care have been much, much higher. Uh, you know, of course, the federal government is contributing more to the state than we initially thought it would this year. But where are we going to be in five years when that that matching rate will likely go down? Is the state going to be on the hook? for much more than we had initially anticipated? Well, that's a great question. I, you know, I think um, while Milliman got it wrong, I think um, intuitively when we did expansion, we realized that there were many people deferring their healthcare costs, right? They weren't getting uh, preventive care and primary health care. And so once they were able to do that, they're discovering or treating uh, illnesses that are now chronic. You know, I think so many people in our country who have had health care their whole life really take for granted the importance of primary health care and seeing, being able to see a doctor sooner than later. And so I do think that, I mean, we intuitively knew that was going to happen you know, folks were letting things go because they couldn't afford it, they couldn't do it, et cetera. So I do think that Representative Wood actually had a good suggestion that the House floor killed was to then, uh, his he had a bill that I would have supported in the Senate to take some of the savings that we have now and put it into a fund that we could utilize in times of need. I think that, you know, that's saving for the rainy day, right? I think that was a really great option. Um, 
I'm, I was so sorry to see that got killed. Um, but back to your other question, I think too, I see Medicaid in a different way. I see healthcare in a different way. I see it as an investment. When we can invest in people and their health, they're gonna be more productive. They're gonna be better employees. They're gonna be able to pay their taxes. They're gonna be productive members of our community. And I do think the role of government is to think proactively. We do so much responding instead of prevention. You know, I was looking through the health and welfare book and the budget, like how much money are we spending on prevention? and really up, up river solutions. Um, government has not really looked that direction much, but I think if we could shift, just like with early learning programs, start to invest there, just like Representative Wood said with the CAT fund, keep the other mechanisms in place. But once we start up river, we'll start to see those things declining. So, I mean, I just see, you know, I, I see the picture a little bit differently than my um, house colleagues, I think. <laughs> You know, I, one last question before I let you go. Chairman Wood, you know, earlier in the session, there was a proposal, um, a bipartisan proposal on medical marijuana. It would have been a, a very restrictive, I believe the most restrictive in the country, um, an allowance for uh, certain patients to get a prescription for medical marijuana that hasn't yet received a hearing. Will it this session? Melissa, no, it won't receive a hearing this session. There's simply not the votes to even move it out of committee. Um, and uh, certainly not the votes to get it across the floor. So, you know, I one of the one of the jobs of a chairman is to make sure that if you're going to have legislation, um, that you have to have legislation that even has a chance to start with. Uh, um, we, we managed after a number of years to actually get it introduced. I don't think I, I could have ever gotten it introduced prior to this year, uh, but we happen to have um, Sergeant uh, Kitzhaber, who is a wonderful individual. Um, if anybody ever deserved uh, anything out of this legislature, it would be somebody like that. Um, but you know the votes the votes simply aren't there and so rather than march a piece of legislation out where people are going to beat on it and then beat on the people who vote for it or vote, vote against it that's inappropriate and and you know when you sign on to be a chairman that's one of the roles that you do and uh so and and i've uh informed him uh and uh Minority Leader Rebel, who was one of the co-sponsors, and uh, Representative Kingsley, that uh, it's it's not going to unfortunately go any further this year. All right, Senator. Oh, Senator, please. I yeah, Senator. I just I just was going to comment on that. I just you know I really appreciate Representative Wood and his um, responsibility. I'm just really disappointed in the legislature overall that we we cannot see past our fear and conjecture to really help folks in medical need and crisis. My own mother was dying of cancer and could have benefited very much. She was wasting away. She couldn't eat. And the doctor said, if we only could have used that, it could have actually stimulated her appetite and helped her a great deal. And I think we are being so short-sighted and I'm deeply troubled by the fact that we have the uh, constitutional amendment trying to make its way through that would preempt uh, psychoactive drugs in the future and putting that in our constitution. I just, I am so troubled and I get email after email for my constituents who are so upset about the fact that we can't advance medical mar marijuana and that we're seeing this bill uh, from Senator Grow. All right, Representative Wood, Senator Wintrow, thank you both so much for your time. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.